Good morning. Today is the sixth day of first Adar, the fifteenth of February. We're continuing with Machatzit Hashekel, Rundaf Samechem Mudalos. We did. We did. Uviu Rodavel. No, we, there's one small piece we didn't say here. We said, this is the meaning of Kitisa et Rosh B'nei Yisrael, meaning that it's when Moshe wants to elevate the people of Israel, the Israelites, what does it mean that he wants to elevate them? So he has a very particular definition here that I don't think is a definition from Kabbalah, it's from him, that we said that there's both the Nukva and the Zah have a Keter, they have a crown, and originally they were the same height. It says in the Arizal that they originally came out of, out of Tiferet of Tvuna. That's, they had the same crown until the moon came and said, lesson, uh, how can two uh, kings use the same crown? So Hashem said, go lessen yourself. So she became shorter, as it were, of shorter stature. And so her crown only reaches his chest. Okay. But now he's saying he wants to elevate the crown of the nukva. He wants to elevate the crown of the feminine counterpart of the small countenance. And that's called Rosh Bnei Yisrael. So it's a very interesting definition. When you say the head of the Israelites, the children of Israel, where you're referring to, according to the Alter Rebbe, is to the Keter of Nukva, to the crown of Nukva. Lalot lemala mala ba'atzilut, to raise it into the world of emanation, into Atzilus. So then they will all give half of a shekel, which is half of this machatzit. So what we said there were two definitions of machatzit. Either it's the, the parting or the part, right? Either it's half or the having. So which one is it here? Which machatzit are we talking about here? Half of the lights, half of the chasadim that Za received, they are now going to give it, meaning that they first have to receive it from Za. So, first, the Keter of Nukva has to receive these aspects of loving kindness, and then it causes it to awaken, to rise. Okay? And, by, and that's what they're giving. Meaning, it's a very interesting thing. They're giving, the Israelites are giving the half shekel. Giving the half shekel is like giving half of the chasadim that you have. So each Jew that's giving it, he's like za. Okay. And by giving it, who's he giving it to? He's giving it to the keter of nukva. Even though it goes into a pushka, and then you use it for the communal sacrifices. But here you understand that the communal sacrifices have exactly that purpose of elevating the Keter of Nukva. Okay. So this whole situation of Moshe Rabbeinu being involved and what's he doing there exactly, we can understand this based on the verse in Tehillim 37, in Psalms 37, Shchon Eretz Ureh Emuna. Start from the beginning. Pudach Ba'ashem, trust in Hashem, Asetov, do good, dwell in the land, and shepherd faith. Perush Re'e Kmo Haro'e. To shepherd, here he just tells us that in Hebrew that it means the same thing as a shepherd. To shepherd is both the, in English, it's both the, the verb and the noun. Hamanhik Tsono Basadot. Who's the Namun found the Samtamid? So the shepherd, what does he do? He takes the flocks out to eat, to graze, and he's responsible all the time to making, for making sure that they have uh, food. And he's always responsible for their well being, but specifically for, for their food. Zanamun found the Samtamid. Mochen, Nikra Moshe Raya Mehemna. In the same way, Moshe Rabbeinu is called the faithful shepherd, Raya Mehemna. Except that, you can read it in two ways. We always say this. You can read it either a faithful shepherd or the shepherd of faith. In either case, 
What is it coming to say? He says, שהוא הזן ומפרנס בכל דור לכנסת ישראל הנקראת אמונה. He is the one who in every generation, because of the extension of Moshe Rabbeinu into every generation, how do we know that there's an extension? Because we read in, in uh, Yitro, uh, in Mishpatim, just before, uh, just last week, we read that you will come up to me, he says, וגם בך יאמינו לעולם. And they will trust and they will have faith in you forever. What do we have faith in you? So everybody understands why he's not having faith in Moshe Rabbeinu because Moshe Rabbeinu died. So what does it mean to have faith in him? So it says to have faith in his Torah. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say they'll believe in the Torah. It says they'll believe in you forever. So the way, you have to explain it some other way. So the way that the Tikkun Ezor explains it is that there's an extension of Moses into every generation. And in every generation, there is a leader who is from Moses' soul. He takes his, he takes his power, his ability. He's an incarnation or a pregnation of Moshe's soul. So in every generation, he says, his duty, why does he come? In order to teach faith to the Knesset Yisrael, to the congregation of Israel. Hinei, why do they need that? Hinei Yisrael ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. We say about the Jewish people that they are Faithful, the son of faithful. Believe. They believe. But they don't believe because they came to some great conclusion. And it's not like a Jewish baby is born and at two years old we begin to teach him faith. <laughs> they don't teach faith at all. Where does it come from? In their divine soul, it's already engraved it's already part of their nature to believe and listen to what it means to have faith in the creation of the world. That was Avram's faith. That was the great um, revelation of Avram, as opposed to all the idolaters of his generation, what he was working against. Because the most important thing that happens when you understand that the world was created by God is that you understand it has one source. It has a source, and that source is intelligent, it's conscious, way beyond that also, but at least that, at least as much as you are, and uh, has purpose. It's at least as much as you. It's not you, less than you. No. When you think about the universe, and the way that a scientist will think about it, the scientist will say that the beginning of the universe is much stupider than I am. That, that's the whole thinking in science. It doesn't make any sense, does it? No, but they say it goes from the simple to the complex, yes. which makes some sense, but to say that it started out simple and it got more and more and more complex, the problem is that it leaves you with no purpose to the universe. Yes. Because the simple didn't have any yeah, purpose. Yeah, yeah. It's only the complex that has purpose. Yeah. So if there's no purpose, and that's, that's what... I mean, there's you know. sure is no purpose. Right. There's right. no... The, at, at the beginning, it was right. random. Ran the, yeah. the, the randomness worked against entropy somehow and turned into, into order. I don't know how that ever works, but let's say it does. When you have intelligence to work against entropy, it's not so hard. If I take basic materials, I take some metal, I take some uh, plastic, I take those, and make a watch out of it, so the watch didn't make itself against entropy. I am what's working against entropy, so I could order those materials into a watch. But if you would find a watch in the middle of the Sahara, you wouldn't say, ah, the Sahara created, created a watch. This watch. Because there's no such thing. Because nothing that is natural can work that strongly against entropy and create a watch. That's not going to happen. So, but still, scientists still believe that this is true. They, uh, not scientists, uh, mathematicians certainly don't believe this is true because it, it's not true. Uh, physicists at a high level, I don't think, that, uh, uh, can, can tolerate this type of thinking. But biologists who are pseudoscientists when it comes to exact sciences, they can believe this nonsense. So they say, ah, it worked against entropy because of random events. Yeah, okay. In any case, th there's not enough time in all time, you can imagine, to have random events actually work against entropy. But that's a different topic. But when Avram came and said that, and he, he realizes that the world was created by God, the main thing that he received was purpose. Then there's purpose. 
But more importantly, the Greeks also believed that God runs the world. They thought it had purpose. But they didn't think that it was created by God. A very different thing. They thought it was only animated by God. He's the prime mover. He's the first mover. But the world already existed. So for them, the, God is like the soul of the world. He's added to the world. There's a world, and then God is added as a world, like a soul. But by Avraham, he's kel olam. He and the world are the same thing. He's not added to the world. He's not the God of the world, as we say. He's not kel ha-olam. He's not the God of the world. He's not the soul of the body. He and the are at least one. And what that means is, and this was very important for him, that God is in everything. It's not like the way that a idolater would say, it's fine to kill a person and sacrifice him. You couldn't say that. Because if God is life is God, and God is good, and everything is good, and everything is life, and you can't go against it. So it, it leads to a whole series of different uh, uh, extrapolations that come from that, which we're not going to get into now. But that was what was ingrained in our souls. From that moment on, from Avraham, from Abraham, from that moment on, every Jew has ingrained in his divine soul, that creation is from nothing to being. And if you go deep into what this means, like the Baal Shem Tov did, then you come to the conclusion that this is not talking about just creation that happened 5,784 years ago, not talking about that. We're talking about the fact that every Jew feels in their divine soul that creation is happening right now, that God is right now bringing everything into being. Because as we said, God is not added to being. There's no being without God. So if God is not willingly making being at this moment, there is no being. So at every moment you feel that this is being now fluxed into being by God's will. And everything here, that's how it has to be. And we told the joke about the guy who said uh, the Rebbe should uh, bless God with a, with a, with a refuah shleima, right? The whole joke from the Rebbe Rayat. You heard this a hundred times. Oh. Uh, there was a, a bunch of Hasidim sitting down with some misnagdim. I told this here also, but I'll tell it again. It's a good joke. So they're having a Ferbrengen, trying to make peace between the two groups, and finally they drink enough that one of the Hasidim says, you la- I remember that you laughed at this, he said, the Rebbe should bless Hashem that you should be healthy. <laughs> he meant to say Hashem should bless the Rebbe that he should be healthy, but it came out that way, it came out that he said that the Rebbe should bless Hashem that he should be healthy. So there was big uproar. The Hasidim, they're crazy, they're, they have false, false beliefs. So there was somebody there who was an uh, older chassid and he, and he calmed him down. He said, look, l- let's analyze this for a second. If God doesn't want the world to exist, he says to the misnagdim there, what does he have to do? So one of them says, he has to burn it. He'll burn it in fire. Okay, so what does he do with the ashes? He has to scatter them. Okay, but they're scattered, so what do you, how do you get rid of them? He thinks and he thinks and he can't come out. So he said that that kind of God needs a refu shlema. If that's what you think God is, then he needs, that kind of God really needs a refuah What does he mean to say? God doesn't want the world to exist. It doesn't exist. It's finished. It doesn't have to do anything. It just has to stop willing it to exist. So that's what he means. When you think about what this really means, that a Jew has in his divine soul a faith in creation, what it really means is he understands that there's no existence without God. And what that means is that, that we, are, we, we don't teach this. It's, it's a feeling that people have. You never teach this to anyone. You can't, you can't even teach this. I, I mean, today maybe you could show some movie, I don't know, something coming out of nothing. But even that wouldn't make any sense because where did the movie come from? And you keep, keep going back. In any case, the whole Abu'im, the Echshem Telim Bemetziut, the Gabem Kuram, who Chayut Alukut. And he feels. This faith, this ingrained faith in every Jew's divine soul is that all creations, all the creatures, are all nullified in their existence, their very being, to their source in God's life force. That's where it all comes from. 
כמו שכתוב, כי עמך מקור חיים, as the verse says, with you is the source of life, but it's not you, it's with you. He gives life to everything, he creates the world, the world is not him, it's not the same thing, but with him is, he has the source of all life. הם משיגים כל זה בתכלית מצד חוכמה שבנפשם האלוקית. So all this, where do we get from? It's called the wisdom of the divine soul. Who's the wisdom of the divine soul? We already know, that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay. That's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu represents. ומה שנקרא אמונה הוא על שם ההטבעה שהוטבעה זה בנפשם מצד שורשם האבות הן המרכבה והם נקראים אומנים לכנסת ישראל. And the reason we call this אמונה, אמונה is translated as faith, as belief, but it doesn't mean that in Hebrew at all. It doesn't mean that at all. Nobody knows what it means. The closest we have is that it's related to the word truth. <laughs> but yeah. emuna doesn't mean faith. There's no Hebrew word for faith. I, no, there's, a, there's no separate Hebrew word that we know that means faith. What happened? That this word, which we don't know exactly how it's derived, is the closest yeah. is the Radak, which says related to emes, and it says like a nun added, like in develis, or it becomes omenet, or something like that. So he says, this, is, this thing that was ingrained in their divine soul came from the patriarchs. Why from the patriarchs? Because the patriarchs are called the Umanim Leknesset Yisrael, Kmo HaUman, or HaOmen Et HaYonek. He's like a nurse. The patriarchs were like the nurses of the Israelites, of the Jewish people, the Jewish souls. What do you mean the nurse? He's the one who, who feeds him in the beginning. Right, and uh, omen, omenet, um, is like someone who makes sure that the child from birth to, I don't know, age two, three, four, five, whatever, has milk to eat, to eat. they feed him. Sometimes, if it's a female, huh? So the child ne- needs this food, and the, the omen, if it's, especially if it's a woman, could be a wet nurse. It could be yeah. somebody who's actually feeding them. So that's how we see the patriarchs. They're like our wet nurses. What did they do? They, they, by feeding us this faith in creation, and again, creation here as God creating everything out of nothing, and therefore everything being imbued with His will at every moment, that's how they gave birth to, that's why we call them patriarchs and matriarchs. They give birth as a word to this people. Okay, we'll continue tomorrow with that. Is that the